Good evening, it's Monday, June 7th. Vice President Kamala Harris meets with the President of Guatemala on the first leg of her Central American trip to try and stem the flow of migration from the region. President Biden has tasked Harris with working on the root causes of migration like poverty, violence, and local, local corruption. The goal of our work is to help Guatemalans find hope at home. At the same time, I want to be clear to folks in this region who are thinking about making that dangerous trek to the United States-Mexico border. Do not come. Do not come. The Biden administration's legislative agenda takes a big hit as a key Democratic senator says he will not vote for the largest overhaul of U.S. election law in at least a generation, leaving no plausible path forward for legislation that the Democratic Party and the White House have portrayed as crucial. West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin also reiterates his opposition to doing away with or modifying the filibuster, imperiling nearly all of the Democrats' legislative initiatives. Israeli police block a planned procession by Jewish ultranationalists through parts of East Jerusalem's old city, following warnings that it could reignite tensions that led to a punishing 11-day war with Gaza last month. A driver plows a pickup truck into a family of five, killing four of them and seriously injuring the other in an attack in Canada that targeted targeted the victims because they're Muslims. And the Santa Cruz Sentinel newspaper reports that an Air Force sergeant accused of killing two law enforcement officers in Northern California last year was part of a right-wing militia known as the Grizzly Scouts that held firearms training, scouted protests, and laid out terms of war against the police. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. Vice President Kamala Harris has made her first trip abroad as Vice President of the United States with a visit to Guatemala. She met with Guatemalan President Alejandro Gemete and later joined him to take talk about new initiatives to address the root causes of illegal migration from the Southern Triangle countries, including poverty, corruption, and human trafficking. Christopher Martinez files this report. La excelentísima señora Kamala Harris, vicepresidenta de los Estados Unidos de América. Vice President Kamala Harris gave her first address abroad in Guatemala City, where she laid out plans to deal with what she calls the root causes and acute causes of migration from Central American countries to the United States. She spoke after what she described as a robust and candid conversation with Guatemalan President Alejandro Jamate. The president and I discussed a fundamental belief that most people don't want to leave home. They don't want to leave the place where they grew up, where the language they know is spoken, where their culture that they know is present and has been, in this case, for centuries. Most people don't want to leave where their grandmother lives. And when they do, it is usually for one of two reasons. Because they are fleeing some type of harm, or because to stay means that they cannot provide for their essential needs and the needs of their family. She says they talked about giving people a sense of hope, hope that help is on the way and that they and their needs are seen. As I mentioned, Mr. President, I believe that our world is interconnected and interdependent. And certainly the most recent issues that have plagued our globe, including the pandemic, have made that point clear. Our world is interconnected and interdependent. And therefore, what happens abroad 
is of priority to the United States of America. Harris says the U.S. is donating 500,000 vaccine doses to Guatemala, and she described other initiatives to help address the drivers of migration. Those initiatives come in three areas, security, economic development, and anti-corruption. On security, Harris and Jamate agreed on measures to address drug smuggling and human trafficking. Our nations have collaborated on these issues, and we will create a smuggling and human trafficking task force, which will work with local law enforcement to stop these crimes. Another key driver of illegal migration is poverty. Jamate and Harris note that most migration from Guatemala comes from the poorest regions. On that point, Harris described moves to boost private investment in Guatemala by eco-entrepreneurs to deal with climate issues and job creation, along with other programs to address the lack of economic development. We will launch a Young Women's Empowerment Initiative to increase education and economic opportunities for girls and women. Understanding here in Guatemala, there is a rich tradition of girls and women being a part of the culture and the economy with extraordinary skills and therefore the ability to thrive when seen as someone who can be the source of investment for the economic growth of the entire community. To deal with corruption, Harris announced a task force, including the U.S. Department of Justice and other agencies, to support anti-corruption investigations and prosecutions in Guatemala. In addition to the new policies, Harris also had some advice for potential migrants. On the issue of uh, Republicans' political um, attacks or criticism um, or even concerns, uh, the reason I am here in Guatemala as my first trip as Vice President of the United States um, is because this is one of our highest priorities and I came here to be here on the ground to speak with the leader of this nation around what we can do in a way that is significant, is tangible and has real results. And I will continue to be focused on that kind of work as opposed to grand gestures. Many Republican lawmakers have blasted Harris and President Joe Biden for not visiting the U.S.-Mexico border. But Harris rejects those criticisms. I want to be clear to folks in this region who are thinking about making that dangerous trek to the United States-Mexico border. Do not come. Do not come. The United States will continue to enforce our laws and secure our border. There are legal methods by which migration can and should occur. But we, as one of our priorities, will discourage illegal migration. After her Guatemala visit, Harris flew next to Mexico, where she'll stay overnight. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. President Joe Biden today invited Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky for a White House visit this summer. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said Biden extended the invitation during a telephone call with Zelensky, who has publicly raised concerns about Biden's plan to meet with Russian leader Vladimir Putin and about a nearly completed Russia to Germany natural gas pipeline that would allow Russia to bypass Ukraine. Biden made the invitation during a call that had been planned in advance of Biden's trip to Europe that culminates with a stop in Geneva next week for a face-to-face meeting with Putin as tensions in the U.S.-Russia relationship remain high. Simon Marks filed this report. Joe Biden is not meeting with Vladimir Putin despite our country's differences. He's meeting with him because of our country's differences. President Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, insisting the president will not hold back during his upcoming summit meeting with the Russian leader. They'll sit down in Geneva on June the 16th. Before that, President Biden will be in the UK for this weekend's G7 summit in Cornwall. And at the White House today, Jake Sullivan was effusive in praising the collaboration that he says is underway with Prime Minister Boris 
Boris Johnson. Their meeting together will just cover the waterfront. I mean, a really wide range of issues where the two of them and the US and the United Kingdom do see eye to eye. Simon Marks reporting. Meanwhile, a senior European Union official said today Russia must change its behavior if it wants better relations with the EU. Charles Michel, who chairs EU Summit, said in a statement that EU-Russia relations are at a low point and that situation, or a worse one, is in neither side's interests. After a telephone call with Russian President Putin, Michel said the EU and Russia disagree on a wide range of issues, including human rights, Russia's intervention in Ukraine, and Moscow's treatment of jailed Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny. Reporter Stuart Smith has more from Brussels. Both Russian President Vladimir Putin and European Council President Charles Michel agreed that poor relations meet the interests of neither side and should be improved. But for that, the EU wants Russia to change the way it treats its citizens, while Russia wants the EU to stop what it describes as interference in Russia's internal affairs. The leaders disagreed on new EU sanctions against Belarus, which the Russian president called counterproductive. No common ground either on the status of Crimea, which Ukraine and the EU insist remains Ukrainian but is now administered by Russia. Stuart Smith, London. The trial in a Dutch court of three Russians and a Ukrainian accused of involvement in the downing of Malaysian airliner in Ukraine seven years ago moved today to the crucial merits phase when lawyers and judges discussed evidence in a Dutch court. Lucy Huff reports. The trial at a court in the Netherlands formally began in March last year, but has so far been dealing with legal arguments about the admissibility of evidence in the crash. Monday marks the start of the full criminal trial, with three Russians and one Ukrainian accused of involvement in the downing of MH17 in July 2014. The men are believed to be key figures amongst pro-Russian separatist rebels fighting in the Ukrainian region. All four are being tried in absentia, with only one Oleg Pulitov being represented by a lawyer. And that's Lucy Huff reporting from Brussels. The Biden administration's legislative agenda took a big hit over the weekend as a key Democratic senator said he will not vote for the largest overhaul of U.S. election law in at least a generation, leaving no plausible path forward for legislation that his party and the White House have portrayed as crucial for protecting access to to the ballot. Voting and election reform that is done in a partisan manner will all but ensure partisan divisions continue to deepen, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia wrote in a home state newspaper, the Charleston Gazette Mail. He wrote that failure to bring together both parties on voting legislation would risk further dividing and destroying the republic we swore to protect and defend as election officials. And he elaborated on the CBS Face the Nation program. I've always been about bipartisan. Uh, ship. I've always tried to work in a bipartisan way, and I've voted in a bipartisan way in the last 10 years of the Senate. So I'm doing what I have always done. Let's unite this country. Without Manchin's vote in the evenly divided Senate, Democrats have no plausible path forward for legislation they consider critical. The voting bill would restrict partisan gerrymandering of congressional districts, strike down hurdles to voting, and bring transparency to a murky campaign finance system. Among dozens of other provisions, it would require states to offer 15 days of early voting and allow no-excuse absentee balloting. It comes as dozens of Republican-controlled states have pushed restrictive new voting laws. Those laws have been linked to former President Trump's false claims of fraud in his 2020 election loss. But it's not just Manchin. It's also Democratic Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema defending the filibuster. And it's not just one, but two voting rights bills and Also, President Biden's infrastructure bill and legislation that's passed the House on immigration reform, policing and police brutality, labor law and union rights, and gun violence. Mary Sherman filed this report. Enough is enough. No more thoughts and prayers. It's time for action. 
It's time to save lives. Today is National Gun Violence Awareness Day, and Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal of Washington urged the Senate to end the filibuster to pass gun safety legislation. So far in 2021, there have been about 240 mass shootings, 8,100 gun deaths, and 51,000 gun injuries. When Republicans filibustered a proposed January 6th commission, calls grew louder to end the Senate practice. However, Democrats Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin remain opposed to changes. Cinema argues it encourages compromise. It is a tool that protects the democracy of our nation rather than allowing our country to ricochet wildly every two to four years back and forth between policies. To reach a compromise on his infrastructure bill, President Joe Biden proposes keeping 2017 Republican tax cuts intact and instead to strengthen tax enforcement on the wealthy and close corporate loopholes. The two sides' proposals are still $750 billion apart. For Pacifica Network and Public News Service, I'm Mary Sherman. Meanwhile, gun safety advocates in the state of Maine are urging the legislature there to take up bills they hope would reduce the impact of gun violence on their constituents. The Lee Bulky reports. Maine has relatively low rates of violent crime compared to the nation, says Jeff Bickford with the Maine Gun Safety Coalition. But he notes that accidental shootings and suicide deaths, especially among children and teens, are far too common. His group works with pediatricians to educate Mainers on safe gun storage. We have extremely lax laws. In fact, we're noted for almost an absolute lack of gun safety laws. We have no, absolutely no regulation on concealed carry. One bill called Darien's Law would close what's known as the gun show loophole, meaning it would require people who buy guns from private sellers to pass a background check. Other legislation proposes regulations for safe storage of firearms in the presence of children and would ban 3D printed guns and what are known as ghost guns, untraceable weapons that people assemble at home. Bickford adds Maine has a higher death rate due to injury from firearms than other New England states. And the majority of gun deaths in Maine are suicides, 88%, according to the Educational Fund to Stop Gun Violence. We are demanding that our lawmakers, who are tasked, first and foremost, with protecting the Maine public and uh, protecting Maine kids who cannot otherwise protect themselves, um, to, to pass these laws and for the governor to sign them. Between 2010 and 2019, Maine's gun death rate increased by 45 percent and the firearm suicide rate went up nearly 40 percent. It's estimated that nearly half of Maine adults are gun owners. Bickford adds his group doesn't want to ban guns outright, but to promote responsible ownership of those firearms. For Maine News Service, I'm Lily Bulky. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. A massive die-off of salmon in Northern California's Klamath River has prompted the Karuk tribe to declare a climate emergency. Historically low precipitation and excessive heat have combined to create the worst river conditions in modern history. Tribal leaders are attributing the dire situation to climate change and a series of dams on the upper Klamath River for diminishing its natural flow. Those factors are causing fish to become infected by a parasite that could wipe out an entire generation of Chinook salmon in the Klamath. Because of the extreme drought conditions, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation decided last month not to release special flushing flows of water down the river in order to scour the channel and dilute spores produced by the parasites. Vic Bedoyan reports from Fresno. Karuk leaders say the worst hydrologic conditions in modern times are straining the Klamath River and salmon survival to the breaking point. A disease-causing parasite called Serotonova shasta is killing 95% of juvenile Chinook salmon and deforming the rest. Taz Soto is the fisheries program manager for the Karuk tribe. He says the parasite wouldn't be as much of a problem if more water were flowing down the river. Salmon are, are, are very resilient animals. I mean, they can, they can handle a lot, um, but we push them over their limit, and... You know, when, when the Karuk declared a climate emergency, it was in part because we're seeing the, the, the frequency of, of these events happen, um, you know, more often. And we're starting to see, you know, a population um, decline. Uh, Karuk tribal fishermen 
are having a very difficult time catching salmon for their subsistence, and that's affecting, you know, people's health, um, not only physical health, but just mental health as well. Uh, fishing is a, is a huge part of the culture. Soto pointed out that the tribe's monitoring traps are filled with dead salmon. This dire situation has been compounded by the Bureau of Reclamation's decision not to release flushing flows into the lower Klamath because of the historically low precipitation and snowpack in Northern California this year. Climate change is the reason for the current catastrophe. The Karuk have responded by crafting strategies to combat the warmer and drier circumstances. We developed the, the climate, climate adaption plan a number of years ago in, you know, in response to the things we're seeing here. And, and you know, part of that plan is to do, you know, fix fish passage around dams and, and reestablish spring genetic populations in the, in the upper climate. Another huge part of that plan is to restore fire regimes in the climate here. We, we um, you know, the group have a, 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 a rich history of, of using fire as a tool and, you know, burning certain times of the year to, you know, obviously enhance natural resources. But one of the side effects of, of burning is, is smoke, and smoke actually cools the river off. Soto says diversity is the name of the game for salmon. So they have created projects to give the fish options and provide them with access to cold water. That includes restoration projects such as building floodplain habitat and connecting with groundwater-fed channels of cold water that salmon can access as a refuge from the warming river channel. But according to Soto, that's not the only problem salmon are facing. We've also lost diversity in the type of salmon we have. We, 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 our our spring show salmon um, have been reduced just down to a few hundred animals. Um, the Salmon River is really the last, has the last population of, of of spring chinook in the Trinity. Um, and you know, that population in the salmon is, is, is really being affected by climate change. Warmer temperatures um, in the Salmon River have, have caused um, fish kills in the past. We're down to just a few hundred fish now. Um, in 2015, we had a, a pretty large adult salmon kill um, on the Salmon River. And, and we lost a good part of that population. And, and since then, it really hasn't recovered. Um, it's important that we keep those that population viable until we can take out the dams and repopulate the upper basin with spring chinook. The most critical dynamic for salmon survival are the four dams that were built on the Klamath River early in the 20th century. Those dams are now slated to be taken down in 2023 because they provide neither flood control nor irrigation. It will be the largest dam removal project in the world. The Karooks say that is a top priority for reviving adequate flows to save the salmon population. They're now doing what they can to mitigate the current disastrous hydrologic conditions and hoping the salmon can survive the next two years until dam removal takes place. In order to protect as many fish as possible, the Karook tribe is urging state and federal agencies to broker temporary water transactions to keep critical stream reaches wet. The Bureau of Reclamation has committed to help mitigate the impacts of this year's historic low water supply. Reclamation has already promised $15 million in immediate aid to project water users through the Klamath Project Drought Response Agency. An additional $3 million in technical assistance will be available to tribes for ecosystem activities in the Klamath Basin. Vic Bedoyan reporting for the KPFA News and KFCF Radio. Nevada Governor Steve Sisolak has signed legislation to make the state the first in the country to ban certain kinds of grass. The measure signed last Friday will ban water users in southern Nevada from planting decorative grass so they can serve water. The grass ban starts in 2027 and applies to office parks, entrances to housing developments, and street medians. It does not apply to homes or parks. Water officials say the ban will eliminate about 40% of the grass in the region. The ban comes as western states that rely on the Colorado River for water prepare for the federal government to issue its first ever official shortage declaration. 
Extreme heat and drought due to climate change is making it more difficult for water utilities in the West and the Southwest to deliver to their customers. Mark Richardson reports. A new report from the Water Utility Climate Alliance details the enormous toll that extreme heat takes on both the utilities' workers and infrastructure, making it more difficult to deliver water. Mohamed Mahmoud with the Central Arizona Project explains there's a cumulative effect on climate warming that can't help but change the conditions in which they operate. Not only are the peak temperatures within the summer season increasing, but also the frequency of days where we're in that higher band of temperature, certainly above 100 degrees, and even more so above 110 degrees, those days are increasing. Mahmoud, who also chairs the Water Utility Climate Alliance, says they ordered the study to project how climate warming might affect the way his industry operates and to suggest ways to adapt over the next few decades to continue delivering water without interruptions. To protect employees, the study recommends changes in work rules, more frequent breaks, providing cooling and hydration stations, and modifying work hours. For facilities and equipment, Mahmoud says they use a formula to gauge how long their infrastructure will last. Every 10 degrees Celsius increase or 18 degrees Fahrenheit increase in temperature reduces the lifespan of those assets by about a half. So as we're looking at some of these projections, yes, they're not necessarily jumping overnight, but can sort of extrapolate that. Mahmoud says the study shows water utilities will need to both adapt to the heat and modify their infrastructure to cope with the coming changes. We may not be able to fundamentally alter droughts, reducing our water supply, but we can find creative ways on how to either conserve the water we use to use water more efficiently if possible, or to even augment the water supply. The full report, called It's Hot and Getting Hotter, is at wucaonline.org. For Arizona News Connection, I'm Mark Richardson. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention now ranks California as one of just two states at the lowest level of coronavirus community transmission. Under the CDC's four-level color-coded system, California's transmission metrics were the lowest out of all 50 states as of Saturday. The CDC determines the level of community transmission based on the number of cases in the last seven days per population of 100,000 and the number of tests in the last seven days that yield a positive result. The agency's color-coded system has four levels, blue the lowest, red the highest. Nationwide, the level of transmission is moderate with a case rate of 28.2 per 100,000. California had 7.8 cases per 100,000 people in the previous seven days. California was 13th on the list of vaccinations given, with 57% of eligible residents having received at least one vaccine dose and 44% fully vaccinated. Officials say the state remains on track to reopen its economy on June 15th. San Francisco City Hall reopened today for the first time in 15 months. Most offices were to be open for full service. City Administrator Carmen Chu said the city is still urging people to continue to take precautions like continuing to wear masks and to maintain social distance when inside the building. The City Hall will be open from 8 to 5 p.m., Weekdays, public restrooms open, hand sanitizers will be available. City Hall workers must undergo a health screening before reporting to work. British health officials say the so-called Delta variant of the coronavirus is 40% more transmissible than the Alpha variant that caused the most recent surge of the virus there. Health ministers say no decision has been made on whether to delay the scheduled easing of COVID restrictions in England on June 21st. More from reporter Chris Jones in London. Ministers say they are open to delay if necessary. Coronavirus cases have been rising in recent weeks as lockdown measures have eased and the India-discovered Delta variant has spread. But hospitalizations and fatalities have remained low. Solicitor General Lucy Fraser says it's still possible the June 21st easing might go ahead. 
What we know at the moment is that the, the infection rate is rising, but that's not seeping out into hospitalizations at the rate that it did in the other uh, lockdowns. So we are seeing a, a flatlining of hospitalizations, and the reason for that is that the vaccination program has been so successful. And so we're seeing uh, very few people who are going into hospital who, who are double vaccinated. India's capital, New Delhi, is preparing to open up as COVID-19 cases continue to fall. Some businesses and public transport will reopen, but with mask and distancing restrictions still in place. Ishan Garg reports from New Delhi. Small businesses and shops can only operate on alternate days and corporate offices have to function only with half the staff. Delhi's local subway will also start plying with reduced capacity, but leisure centres, gyms, spas and salons will remain closed. Authorities are hoping to announce more relaxations next week after India reported just over 100,000 new infections on Monday, the lowest daily tally in the past two months. But officials are concerned about a third third wave that could potentially affect young people more severely. Ishan Garg, New Delhi. The head of the World Health Organization is urging leaders of wealthy developed G7 countries to help the UN-backed COVID-19 vaccination program boost access to doses in the developing world. With G7 leaders set to meet in Cornwall, England this week, WHO Director Tedros Adhanam again called on rich countries to do more to battle inequality in accessing coronavirus vaccines. Tedros recently announced the target of vaccinating at least 10% of the population in every country by the end of September, 30% by year end. He says to meet those targets, the U.N. needs hundreds of millions of vaccine doses in June and July and an additional 250 million doses by September. U.S. government health officials have approved the first drug that they say may help slow Alzheimer's disease. The decision came after the agency's independent advisors said that the treatment had not been shown to help treat the brain-destroying disease. The Food and Drug Administration is not required to follow the advisor's advice and approve the infused drug from Biogen. It's the first new Alzheimer's treatment in nearly 20 years, the only one that FDA has backed to treat the underlying disease rather than manage symptoms. One physician who voted against the drug says he's surprised and disappointed by the approval. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno. Online at kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast, and it airs at 6 o'clock with a half-hour edition on the weekends. I'm Mark Merkel. Canadian police said today a driver plowed a pickup truck into a family of five people, killing four of them, seriously injuring the other, in an attack that targeted the victims because they were Muslims. Authorities said a young man was arrested in the parking lot of a nearby mall after the incident on Sunday night in the Ontario city of London. Police said a black pickup truck mounted a curb and struck the victims at an intersection. Police said the dead were a 74-year-old woman, a 46-year-old man, a 44-year-old woman, and a 15-year-old girl. A 9-year-old boy was reported in serious condition. The family requested the names not be released. Nathaniel Veltman, 20 years old, was in custody, facing four counts of first-degree murder. Police said Veltman, a resident of London, did not know the victims. A detective said police did not know at this point if the suspect was a member of any specific hate group. He said London police were working with federal police and prosecutors to see about possible terrorism charges. The mayor of London, Ed Holter, said it was an act of mass murder perpetuated against Muslims rooted in unspeakable hatred whose magnitude can make one question who we are as a city. In 2017, a French-Canadian man known for far-right nationalist views went on a shooting rampage at a Quebec City mosque and killed six people there.
Efforts to adopt a statewide hate crime bill stalled in North Dakota's legislature this year. But there's some action on the local level. Mike Moen reports. In a preliminary vote this week, the Fargo City Commission advanced a measure that would make hate crimes a Class B misdemeanor. Violators would receive up to 30 days in jail or a $1,500 fine. Local resident Arden Light, who's transgender, spoke in support of the proposal, noting they've been the victim of bias-motivated incidents. With this plan, Light says those who have been targeted can feel they're being lifted up. It tells marginalized and oppressed people that the city is trying to make positive forward movement and that the officials do actually care. North Dakota has a statute that deals with discrimination in public places, but its critics say it lacks teeth for not outlawing hate crimes. Separate legislation this spring that called for a statewide study of the issue noted North Dakota has ranked high in bias-motivated crimes per capita. As for the Fargo plan, a commissioner who voted no said it would only lead to more division in the city. But Barry Nelson of the North Dakota Human Rights Coalition argues not taking action would be even more divisive. He says the ordinance creates tools for the city to help those who have been victimized. Up to this point, people did not know where they should go if they believe they've been a victim of a hate crime. They weren't sure if, in fact, the the concerns they had were being addressed consistently. And Light says they hope the city will also consider adding an educational component to its response, allowing the victim and suspect to discuss what happened through restorative justice. So I think if we can get people in a headspace to really listen and to talk that we can solve not every problem, but some problems. And advocates say while they're hopeful the plan will ultimately win approval, they'll keep pressing commissioners before a final vote. Mike Moen, Prairie News Service. The Santa Cruz Sentinel newspaper reports that an Air Force sergeant accused of killing two law enforcement officers in Northern California last year was part of a right-wing militia known as the Grizzly Scouts that held firearms trainings, scouted protests, laid out terms of war against the police. The newspaper cited court documents that showed the suspected gunman, Stephen Carrillo, was not a lone actor, but a member of an anti-government group that was preparing for more deadly attacks on law enforcement. The court filings reveal the most extensive details yet on the investigation into the May 29, 2020 fatal shooting of Federal Protective Service Officer Dave Patrick Underwood in Oakland and the June 6, 2020 killing of Santa Cruz Sheriff Sergeant Damon Gutzwiller in an ambush in the community of Ben Lomond. Carrillo has pled not guilty to both killings. Federal prosecutors say most members of the Grizzly Scouts are still at large. The newspaper reported the group identifies with a loosely affiliated nationwide militia movement that uses the name Bukaloo and favors Hawaiian shirts and violent rhetoric, but the Scouts' activities appear to be more carefully plotted, according to the newspaper. The court filings that the newspaper's reporting is based on were submitted in the case against four other alleged grisly scouts, including the group's leader, who are accused of destroying evidence relevant to the Underwood and Gutzwiller murder investigations. They were written as part of a failed attempt to keep all four defendants in jail pending trial. A federal magistrate ultimately decided three of them were not a danger to the community and did not pose flight risks. The filings not only confirmed Korea was one of the militia's roughly 25 members, but detailed the group's alleged activities in mid-2020, trainings near one member's home in Turlock, the creation of a Quick Reaction Force, or QRF, and plans to send a member to scout out a protest in Sacramento. The filings alleged that in a document entitled Operations Order, the militia described law enforcement officers as enemy forces and spoke of the possibility of taking some prisoner. The group also allegedly discussed ways to stir up violence between Antifa groups and the police. A new law in Oregon allows Native American students to wear a feather in their cap at their graduation ceremonies. Brian Bull from KLCC Radio in Eugene, Oregon reports. 
Many Native students have worn eagle or turkey feathers with their cap and gown for years, but that adornment was never formally assured until this year. The Oregon legislature passed a bill that Governor Brown then signed in May. Brenda Brainerd is director of the 4J Natives program, which supports Native American culture and learning in Eugene area schools. The fact that students can incorporate their culture into their graduation for themselves and for their community is just wonderful. Allowing Native American students to practice and celebrate their culture is seen by supporters as a way to promote academic achievement and improve retention and graduation rates. For National Native News, I'm Brian Bull. Oregon, Washington, and the Yakima Nation are asking the Biden administration to list a stretch of the Columbia River as a Superfund cleanup site under the Environmental Protection Agency. Eric Tegatoff has that story. Contaminants known as PCBs were found at high levels in the early 2000s above the Bonneville Dam. For decades, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers dumped electrical components in the river. The agency has been cleaning up the site, but non-migratory fish up to a mile from the dam still are listed as do not eat. Rose Longoria with Yakima Nation Fisheries says a toxicologist likened eating those fish to eating hazardous waste. Our concern is not only the health of that ecosystem, but also the fact that families that are dependent on fish resources from that area are collecting resident fish that may be really, really high in PCB concentrations. PCB exposure has been linked to health effects, including cancer. Longoria says levels at the site near Bradford Island are the highest in the Northwest and higher than at other Superfund sites. A request was made to the Trump administration for listing with no response. The Army Corps says it has a responsibility to clean up the area and will continue doing so if it's listed as a Superfund site. Davis Washines, government relations liaison with the Yakima Nation Fisheries, says the tribe has a right to a healthy river and healthy fish. He says cleaning it up is important, not only to the people who live there now, but for generations to come. We have a responsibility, along with other governments, to make sure that for the future, this will be no longer a health hazard. Lauren Goldberg with Columbia Riverkeeper calls it stunning that the Trump administration didn't list the area around Bradford Island as a Superfund site. She says getting the site on the EPA's national priority list would give it stronger legal protections and more funding. Goldberg notes the ongoing health hazards underscore the importance of listing it. To ensure that the Environmental Protection Agency is the lead regulator and that the federal government agency that's responsible for the toxic pollution in the first place, which is the Army Corps of Engineers, is not regulating itself. The EPA says it's evaluating the request. Columbia Riverkeeper expects a decision this summer. For Washington News Service, I'm Eric Tegadoff. You are listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is Kat Brooks. I'm an actor, activist, and freedom fighter. And I'm Brian Edwards Teekert. I mostly do journalism, which kind of sounds boring now. And together, we host Upfront, KPFA's local two-hour morning magazine. We bring you breaking news, debates, deep dives. Reporting on City Hall and the State House. Housing and transportation. Prisons and police. And everything big that happened while you were sleeping. And it means the two of us get to hang out with you at 7 a.m. Right after Democracy Now! on Upfront. Hundreds of protesters vowing to do whatever it takes to stop a Canadian-based company's push to replace an aging pipeline blocked a pump station today in northern Minnesota, with some people chaining themselves to construction equipment before police began making arrests. Environmental and tribal groups say Enbridge Energy's plan to rebuild Line 3 which would carry Canadian tar sands oil and regular crude from Alberta to Wisconsin, would worsen climate change and risk spills in sensitive areas where Native Americans harvest wild rice, hunt, fish, gather medicinal plants, and claim treaty rights. By evening, at least 30 people had been arrested by state police and sheriff's officers, but the number was growing rapidly, according to Ashley Fairbanks, a spokeswoman for Treaty People Gathering. 
None of them appeared to resist as allies chanted, we love you. Protesters said the treaty people gathering was the largest show of resistance yet to the project. The crowd showed no signs of leaving hours after an earlier protester at the headwaters of the Mississippi River, roughly about 20 minutes away, where they chanted, stop line three and water is life. Actress Jane Fonda is one of the protesters, and she held signs with President Joe Biden's image that said, which side are you on? She urged protesters to keep pressuring Biden to halt construction so his administration could study any harm to the environment and indigenous people. The Mississippi River is one of the water crossings <coughs> for the pipeline. <coughs> Fonda said Line 3 protesters <coughs> are going to Standing Rock this place, referring to the Dakota Access Pipeline, which is owned by a different company and was the subject of major protests near the Standing Rock Indian Reservation in the Dakotas in 2016 and 17. Enbridge says the 1960s-era Line 3 Pipeline is deteriorating and can run at only about half its original capacity. It says the new line, made from stronger steel, will better protect the environment while restoring its capacity and ensuring reliable deliveries to U.S. refineries. More than 300 groups delivered a letter to Biden last month calling on him to direct the Army Corps of Engineers to suspend or revoke and bridges federal clean water permit for the project. They urged Biden to follow the example he set on the very first day of his administration when he canceled the disputed Keystone XL pipeline, citing worries about climate change. The Justice Department announced today it's recovered most of the multi-million dollar cryptocurrency ransom payment to hackers after a cyber attack that caused the operator of the nation's largest fuel pipeline to halt its operations last month. The Justice Department formed a special task force to combat the rise in mostly Russian-based hacker groups attacking Western government and business interests. This was its first operation. Georgia-based Colonial Pipeline, which supplies roughly half the fuel consumed on the East Coast, temporarily shut down its operations last month after a gang of hackers known as Darkside broke into its computer system. Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco told reporters that Darkside profits from disrupting U.S. interests. Darkside and its affiliates have been digitally stalking U.S. companies for the better part of last year and indiscriminately attacking victims that include key players in our nation's critical infrastructure. Colonial officials have said they paid roughly $4.4 million in ransom in hopes of bringing itself back online as soon as possible. The ransom was paid in Bitcoin, which is a favored currency of hackers because of the perception it's more difficult to trace. Israeli police said today they blocked a planned procession by Jewish ultranationalists through parts of Jerusalem's old city, following warnings that it could reignite tensions that led to a punishing 11-day war with Gaza. The parade, which celebrates Israel's capture of East Jerusalem in the 1967 Mideast War, was underway on May 10th when Hamas fired rockets from Gaza toward the city, setting off heavy fighting. Some 254 people were killed in Gaza, 13 in Israel, before a ceasefire took effect on May 21st. The war was preceded by weeks of clashes between Israeli police and Palestinian demonstrators in the old city and in the nearby neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah, where Jewish settlers have waged a decades-long campaign to evict Palestinian families from their homes. Israel's attorney general today declined to intervene in the cases of several of the families, making it more likely the evictions will be carried out, possibly in the coming weeks, that could also reignite violence. 
The settlers are using a 1970 law that allows Jews to reclaim formerly Jewish properties lost during the 1948 war surrounding Israel's creation, a right denied to Palestinians who lost property in the same war. At least 150 Palestinian households in Sheikh Jarrah and the neighborhood of Silwan, both near the old city, are at risk of eventual eviction. The procession, which had intended to go through the old city's Muslim quarter, is seen by Palestinians as a provocation. Over the weekend, Israeli police arrested and released a veteran reporter for the Al Jazeera satellite channel who had regularly been covering the Sheikh Jarrah protests. And on Sunday, authorities stormed the home of a leading activist in the neighborhood, arresting her and her brother. The siblings were later released. Renewed tensions in East Jerusalem or fighting with Hamas in Gaza could complicate Israel's shaky politics. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's opponents last week said they have formed a coalition that could remove the prime minister from office after a 12-year term. The new coalition is expected to be sworn into office in the coming days. More from reporter Simon Marks. The implications of the formation of a new Israeli governing coalition for the Biden administration. Just three weeks ago, Washington was convulsed by the war waged by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Now, with the coalition headed by Naftali Bennett hoping to win a parliamentary vote of support over the next few days, things in Tel Aviv are about to change. Bob McMahon with the U.S. Council on Foreign Relations. Because of the, let's say, the diversity of this coalition, Israel, they will push aside some of the fractious issues and basically punt down the road any, anything like ramping up West Bank settlements or trying to annex the West Bank for that matter. And in so doing, that becomes a bit easier to manage for the Biden administration, which would rather not be dealing with thorny Israeli politics, but also a resurgence of fighting with uh, the Palestinians. We've just come through this period, ceasefire still holding between Hamas and uh, the Israeli government after the worst outbreak in violence in seven years. So all in all, you could have a coalition that is actually taking a more moderate stance on some of the fractious issues. Issues. Despite Bennett's own preference on settlement issues, you could have a moderation going on that will sort of calm things. And that means for the Biden administration, maybe a chance to start, you know, building up on a uh, sort of behind the scenes way uh, the relationship with Israel and not get into some of the more difficult issues involved in that relationship. So far, the Biden White House has avoided comment on events in Israel as it waits for the coalition to take office. Simon Marks reporting. The West African nation of Burkina Faso is blaming Islamist militants for the death of 132 civilians and the injuries of countless others in an attack on a village. It's the deadliest extremist attack in the country in years. For five years, Burkina Faso's ill-equipped and undertrained army has been struggling to stem a jihadi insurgency linked to al-Qaeda and the Islamic State group. While no groups claimed responsibility, local analysts are saying this attack was likely carried out by the Al-Qaeda-linked group, JNIM, which has recently strengthened its position in the area. The United States Supreme Court ruled unanimously today that thousands of people living in the U.S. for humanitarian reasons are ineligible to apply to become permanent residents. Justice Elena Kagan wrote for the court that federal immigration law prohibits people who entered the country without authorization and now have temporary protected status from seeking green cards to remain in the country permanently. The House of Representatives has passed legislation that would make it possible for TPS recipients to become permanent residents. The bill faces certain Republican opposition in the Senate. The Supreme Court agreed to decide whether a lawsuit can go forward in which a group of Muslim residents of California alleged the FBI targeted them for surveillance because of their religion. It's the second case the courts accepted for the fall involving a government claim of state secrets. The idea that the government can block the release of information it claims would harm national security if disclosed. A district court dismissed the case after the federal government invoked the state secrets privilege, but an appeals court reversed the decision.
A Supreme Court for now is leaving it up to Congress to decide whether to change the requirement that only men must register for the draft. The requirement was one of the few areas of federal law where men and women are still treated differently. The Supreme Court says it won't take up a case that asked it to decide whether it's sex discrimination for the government to require only men to register for the draft when they turn 18. The last time there was actually a draft was during the Vietnam War. The military has been all-volunteer since then. A bill has resurfaced in Congress and it aims to give all states the ability to replace lead pipes in municipal water systems. Mike Moen reports. This week, a U.S. House committee hears testimony on what is sometimes known as the Get the Lead Out Act, which was reintroduced this month. The bipartisan measure establishes a 10-year deadline to replace toxic lead pipes and provides $46 billion to help states and utilities reach that goal. John Rumplet of the group Environment America says it's an issue that crosses many zip codes around the country. It notes no partisan boundaries. You know, urban, rural, suburban, these lead pipes are everywhere. A 2019 study released by the Minnesota Health Department estimated the state still has 100,000 lead service lines. Rumpler says polls indicate broad public support to take on the problem and thinks the bill would complement similar efforts proposed by the Biden administration. He acknowledges it might be harder for some areas to meet the deadline, but suggests waivers could be granted. In Wisconsin, Rumpler says Madison is an example of U.S. cities already making strides. Not taking aggressive action, he says, would be a disservice to kids who experience the negative health effects of lead exposure in drinking water. It would just be criminal neglect of our children's health for us to be sitting here 10 years from now with millions of lead pipes still in the ground. Research has shown even low-level exposure to lead can affect a child's brain development. The Minnesota report estimates it could cost as much as $4 billion to remove lead from drinking water, It says the benefits associated with the improvements are worth double that amount. Mike Moen, Minnesota News Connection. As the gardening season gets into full swing, groups fighting to save bees and other pollinators are asking nurseries and consumers to avoid plants grown with harmful pesticides. Suzanne Potter reports. As the spring gardening season gets into full swing, groups fighting to save bees and other pollinators are asking nurseries and consumers to avoid plants grown with harmful pesticides. Some pesticides are sprayed on, but others are systemic and poison the nectar. Sharon Salvaggio with the Xerces Society says gardeners may end up harming the pollinators they're trying to protect, so they need to ask questions before they buy. What we want is for people to go to their nursery and say, I want plants that are free of pesticides that might harm pollinators. Xerces has published a tip sheet for consumers on what to ask and another for nurseries on how to offer bee-safe plants. More than a quarter of all North American bumblebees are nearing extinction, and the western monarch butterfly population has plunged more than 99% since the 1980s, a situation experts blame on pesticide use, climate change, and destruction of habitat. Sarah Hoyle, also with Circe's, co-authored a study in 2019 that tested native milkweed across the Central Valley for pesticides because it is a host plant for monarch caterpillars. Pesticides were really ubiquitous kind of everywhere we looked, home gardens, parks, agricultural lands, and wildlife refuges. We were finding that pesticides were present and really all too often at lethal levels. Kendra Klein with the nonprofit Friends of the Earth says her group published a report in 2014 called Gardeners Beware and later secured commitments from Lowe's, Home Depot, and other nursery chains to stop selling plants grown with neonicotinoids and other harmful pesticides. These are pesticides that are highly acutely toxic to bees and other pollinators and are known to be a driver of what some scientists call an insect apocalypse, major declines in pollinator and insect populations around the world. For California News Service, I'm Suzanne Potter. 
Sunny and continued windy in the San Francisco Bay Area tomorrow with highs in the low 60s around the bay. Inland, it should be sunny with highs near 70 degrees. In the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow, sunny with highs in the low 80s. And in Los Angeles, partly cloudy skies with highs in the low 70s. That's it for the news tonight for this Monday, June 7th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. Monday nights starting at 7 p.m. with Africa Today, a weekly program providing information and analysis about Africa and the African diaspora, hosted by Walter Turner. At 8 p.m., it's a soul sonic rhapsody of word, sound, and power on transitions on traditions, hosted and produced by Greg Bridges. Then at 10 p.m., eclectic beats and rhythms take you into Tuesday with Off the Beaten Path, featuring weekly rotating hosts. That's Monday nights on 94.1 FM, KPFA, and KPFA.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org.